Hello, everybody, and welcome to the fiscal year 2016 Continuum of Care program competition broadcast. My name is Norm Suchar. I'm going to be joined uh, by my fellow SNAPS office colleagues, uh, Sid and Linda. They'll be, uh, jo they'll be coming on a little later to talk about some more specifics about the COC application. So I want to talk about a little bit about the highlights of this competition, about some of the differences from last year, uh, and walk you through some of the uh, important things you should be paying attention to during the competition. I want to start by talking about our policy priorities. So you would have seen in the uh, fiscal year 2016 registration notice uh, some information about our policy priorities, and they're also included in the NOFA. I'm not going to talk through each of these, but I want to stress the importance of reviewing these priorities. They really give context to the NOFA and provide you a sense of what the reasons are for, uh, for different things that are in the NOFA and the direction that we're trying to go uh, with the NOFA and with our overall policies. I want to just walk through some of the major differences uh, in this NOFA compared to the last NOFA. So one of the major, most important differences is that Tier 1 is set at 93% of annual renewal demand, uh, which is significantly lower than last year. We know that uh, last year's competition was very uh, challenging. Communities had a lot of funding at stake. Uh, many communities gained a lot of money through the competition process. Many communities lost a lot of money through the competition process. Uh, this year, uh, there's still uh, certainly funding at stake. It's still a very competitive process. Uh, but for COCs, there will be less at stake than there had been last year. Uh, the amount available for bonus is 5% of the annual renewal demand. So again, this is uh, significantly less than last year, uh, but still provides an opportunity for communities to increase the amount of funding they get. There will be some changes to the Tier 2 project scoring that I'll discuss a little later. Uh, one thing I really want to stress the importance of is that we will be asking for reports on system performance measures. This is a very, very important thing for COCs to be paying attention to. Hopefully, you have already done some work on system performance measures. Hopefully, you have uh, seen some reports on system performance measures. Uh, and we will be requiring those in this NOFA, and I'll talk a little more about that later. But I just want to stress the importance of that, not just for this competition, but for future competitions. This is a really important part of what we're doing moving forward. Uh, there, this uh, application will have more focus on performance than, uh, than, the, than previous applications. And again, this is going to be a continuing trend as we focus more and more on performance in the application process. Uh, one of the changes that we have this year that is a result of, uh, of legislative language that was uh, put into our, our appropriations bill is that in order to receive bonus funding, a continuum of care has to demonstrate that they have the ability to reallocate uh, funding. Uh, either They can demonstrate it either by showing that they have reallocated a substantial amount of funding in the past, or that they have set up a process in place, a robust process to do reallocation uh, in this year's competition. So again, this was uh, at the direction of Congress, but a really important uh, feature of the competition and something we want to stress that communities should be thinking about every year is, uh, do we have an opportunity to improve our portf portfolio of projects by doing reallocation? And then another uh, uh, important uh, uh, thing I need to talk about is about the application of uh, fair market rents. This NOFA will be due on September 14th, and uh, our rules state that we have to use the fair market rents that are in place at the time the application is due. So those will be the fiscal year 2016 uh, fair market rents. So most projects will not be seeing an increase based on fair market rents, although there were some communities that did uh, receive mid-year adjustments, so those communities would be seeing uh, increase in their, uh, their project funding to account for fair market rents. But this is an important difference from previous years. I just want to quickly walk through the funding amounts uh, and some concepts related to funding. So the preliminary pro rata need 
uh, is based on the geography that, uh, that COCs claim during the registration process. Uh, the annual renewal demand uh, is going to be based on uh, the final HUD approved GIW, so those have to be completely, absolutely finalized by July 22nd, 2016. In past years, we had really focused on having a 10-day grace period in the process, but uh, uh, this year we have set a, a sort of a firm date of July 22nd to have those uh, complete. It's very, very important that those are accurate, and we really uh, encourage COCs to pay a lot of attention to those, really go through them project by project and line by line to make sure all of the information is accurate. Uh, the final pro rata need is, uh, or FPRN, is going to be based on the higher of uh, preliminary pro rata need or annual renewal demand. Uh, this is the same as it has been for the past uh, several years. The, the planning amount, we're treating this the same as we had in past years. It is, again, 3% of the FPRN. Uh, and the bonus amount, as I mentioned before, is 5% of FPRN. Uh, I just want to, again, stress the importance of getting the GIW right. Uh, as you can see from these points on the slide, uh, when, a, uh, when a project is not included on the GIW, it has some pretty uh, serious consequences uh, for the COC. Uh, and so make sure all your projects are on the GIW. If it happens to be the case that an ineligible project ends up on the GIW, we'll, we'll have to uh, reduce the ARD by the amount of the ineligible project. So again, it's really, really important that you uh, just comb those over line by line and make sure all the information is accurate. I uh, just, again, want to do a quick comparison of the uh, amounts for Tier 1 and for bonus projects compared to last year. Uh, tier 1 is going to be set at 93% of annual renewal demand. Again, that's uh, approximately a little less than uh, uh, half as much that is not being included in Tier 1 as last year. Uh, so, you know, 15% of your ARD was at risk last year and it's only 7% this year. So again, a pretty significant change. Uh, but it's still a very competitive process. Uh, and then the bonus amounts uh, also uh, going down from the uh, previous year from 15% of FPRN to 5% of FPRN. As we did last year, uh, the COC planning and if you're a UFA, the UFA costs will not be ranked. Uh, those will just sort of be uh, automatically funded if you uh, apply with an eligible project. Uh, so those do not get ranked in with your other projects and are not sort of directly competing with other projects. Uh, and then the point I want to stress, this is not a change from last year, but I think there was some confusion last year among some COCs. Uh, bonus projects can be ranked anywhere in Tier 1 or Tier 2, uh, just like reallocation projects can be ranked anywhere in Tier 1 or Tier 2. So it's important uh, that what we really want to see is COCs looking at all their projects, whether they're renewal, whether they're permanent housing, whether they're transitional housing, whether they're reallocations, bonus, whatever the type of project, we really want all of those ranked based on performance. And obviously the top ones are going to end up in Tier 1 and the bottom ones are going to end up in Tier 2. But there's nothing uh, unique about a bonus project that means it has to be in either Tier 1 or Tier 2. We really want these things rated by the COC using objective performance-based criteria. Uh, and uh, again, let those projects uh, fall where that objective process uh, uh, indicates that it should fall. <clears throat> uh, this this uh, slide just sort of shows an overview of the points for each section. I won't go through the uh, overall uh, point structure. I just note that there are 200 points total. There is not a three-point bonus as we did last year. Uh, in general, uh, the points are shifted a little more towards uh, performance-based uh, uh, categories. I want to quickly talk about uh, projects that straddle Tier 1 and Tier 2. There was some uh, confusion in some COCs about how this worked last year, so I just want to walk through this, uh, how we treat those projects uh, and how we plan to do it again this year. So the first thing we do with projects that straddle Tier 1 and Tier 2, so this means that uh, the, that uh, the part of the project is in Tier 1, part of the project is in Tier 2. We evaluate the whole project uh, to de determine if it meets threshold criteria. Uh, the vast majority of projects that we review do meet threshold criteria, 
but if it doesn't, then uh, the project is rejected and it doesn't get selected. Uh, but beyond that, if the project does meet threshold criteria, we, we, we rate the tier two portion of the project just like we would any tier two project. We use the same criteria, same, uh, uh, same factors, same everything. If the tier two portion of the project is selected, then what we do is we conditionally award the entire project. If the tier two project is not selected, then we essentially do a feasibility review of the tier one portion of that project and see if there's a feasible project there uh, that, that we could move forward with. Uh, if it's feasible, then we would select, uh, uh, the, select the project just at the amount of funding that was in Tier 1. Uh, if it's not feasible, we wouldn't award the project at all. Uh, so this is a really important uh, a, a description of how we review these projects. Just wanted to make that clear. Uh, one of the questions that came up last year was that we did two separate funding announcements, one for Tier 1 projects, one for Tier 2 projects. Uh, the, the projects that straddled were awarded as part of the Tier 2 announcement. Uh, if we make two uh, separate awards again this year, we would do that again this year as we would make the uh, projects that straddle part of the Tier 2 announcement. So I want to uh, spend a little time talking about the, uh, the Tier 2 scoring process. So we've made some changes in the point values for the Tier 2 projects, and I want to talk about each one, but also talk about sort of the overall impact on uh, the entire process. So it's still a maximum of 100 points, like it was last year. Uh, the, the COC application score is responsible for 50 of those points. So last year it was 60 points, so it's a little less this year. Uh, basically, we just simply take the... Uh, the COC score, uh, multiply it by uh, 0.25, and that gives us a, a, a point value on a 0 to 50 point scale, and, and so that's the, that's the first part of the score. The COC project ranking, uh, we've significantly increased the amount of points for this. Last year it was 20 points. Uh, this year it's uh, 35 points. I'll talk about the methodology for this in a second. But I uh, wanted to note that we are significantly increasing the number of points for this uh, particular uh, scoring factor. And the reason we did this is we really wanted to, uh, to provide more emphasis on how the local COC ranks projects. What this scoring factor allows us to do is really take into account how the COC is ranking projects. So things that are near the top of, the, of Tier 2 get more funding than things at the bottom of Tier 2. So we really wanted to provide a little more weight uh, to this factor. Overall, this will also have the impact of uh, spreading out uh, funding and resources a little more evenly across COCs uh, across the country. The, uh, the next factor is the project type. Uh, so the project type is worth uh, uh, up to five points. So last year it was worth 10 points. So we, uh, again, have reduced the number of points uh, for this factor. And then the uh, last factor is a commitment to housing first practices. Uh, and this is worth up to uh, 10 points as it was last year. I want to sort of uh, go into one particular issue or a couple particular issues with this uh, this factor, the commitment to housing first practices. So one of the questions we had and that we tried to address, and, and uh, this is actually addressed uh, to some degree in the detailed instructions, uh, but one of the questions was about how we treat certain types of projects and the housing first scores. And I want to call out one, I want to call out uh, projects that are uh, serving people fleeing domestic violence, particularly uh, transitional housing projects that are serving people in uh, fleeing domestic violence and how we, uh, how we treat this. So one of the factors that we consider with respect to the Housing First Practices score is uh, the degree to which the project focuses on helping people move into permanent housing as quickly as possible. But of course, uh, a lot of projects that uh, serve people fleeing domestic violence uh, have a necessary focus on ensuring the safety of 
uh, of those individuals. And we certainly want those projects to be, uh, to have that as their primary concern. So when we talk about, uh, in this context, in the context of, uh, of transitional housing projects serving people fleeing domestic violence, so we're talking about those projects that are serving people who have uh, a, a significant uh, concern about harm or, or at significant risk, uh, we certainly expect those projects to first be concerned with the safety of those individuals and once, they, uh, you know, once their safety is assured, uh, then to start that focus on ensuring that uh, people can move into uh, a permanent housing situation, uh, whether it's in the same community or often for domestic violence projects or people fleeing domestic violence, uh, you'll want to move to a different community, but whatever that is, uh, we're, we really want to focus on safety first, and then uh, once the safety uh, issues are addressed and a person uh, is wanting to move, uh, to help them move into permanent housing as quickly as possible. So this next slide is a little terrifying, but I'm going to sort of walk through the different parts of this slide. Uh, this, is, this, this relates uh, back to the uh, project type score. Uh, that is about uh, how the COC ranks the project. And I just want to walk through uh, how this scoring works. Uh, there was some confusion about this last year. I want to uh, start by stressing that, you know, we tried to draw this to some level of scale, but this is not totally to scale. So if things don't perfectly match up, I just, you know, want to uh, want to say that, you know, we did the best we could, but uh, it's, not, it's not drawn perfectly to scale. But what, I've, what we've done here is just sort of shown uh, a list of projects that uh, 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 COC may be applying for, uh, you know, going from uh, Project A through Project uh, G. And you can't see the top few projects. But uh, you know A, B, C, and D, and part of Project E are all located in Tier One. So the dotted line that goes across uh, sort of the top third of the slide, uh, it uh, shows uh, it's described as the line between Tier One and Tier Two. That shows where the line of these projects is, and the the height of the bar of each project is roughly uh, how much funding is associated with that project. So what you see with Project E. Uh, is I've divided it into two parts. E1 is sort of the portion of that project that's in Tier 1. E2 is the portion of that project is it, that is in, uh, that's in Tier 2. And uh, what you can see is sort of on the right of that bar there is $20,000 is the amount of Project E that is located in Tier 2. And the way we really calculate uh, the, uh, the, the project type uh, or sorry, the COC ranking of the project in that pro zero to 35 point scale, is you can imagine the project sort of being stacked like this, and on the left side sort of having this rule or a ruler or this, uh, you know, this axis that, you know, just has numbers from zero to 35. And if you just sort of draw a dotted line from the middle of that project uh, over to your ruler on the left there, you can sort of see where that project hits. Uh, and this project hits at uh, 32.3 points. And then you look at the next project, and uh, this project is worth $60,000. Uh, and again, you sort of can see where the uh, middle of that uh, project falls on that ruler, and it falls at about 21.5 points. And uh, for Project G, you can see that it falls at about uh, 8.1 points. So I want to at least sort of explain why we did it this way. Uh, what we were really trying to avoid is having any incentives uh, apart from just, you know, ranking the projects based on need and performance. We, we didn't want to have incentives that would encourage people to put projects, you know, close to the top of the line for a reason other than performance and need or to, to apply for bigger projects or smaller projects or things like that. So we tried to create this sort of, this uh, smoother process that didn't, uh, create sort of cliffs and, uh, and, and strange incentives. And I realize that there's a lot of, this is complicated in a lot of senses, and uh, there's even some math involved. Uh, but uh, we really feel like this uh, eliminates a lot of those negative incentives. And I think the way for COCs to really look at this rating factor 
is this is just a way for us to take more account of how the COC is ranking projects, and there's no real way to gain an advantage from this. All this means is that the projects you ranked higher are going to get more points and are going to be more likely uh, to be funded. So this next slide, this just shows the math. I'm not going to talk about this, but uh, those of you who are totally interested, you can just sort of hit the pause button on this broadcast and, uh, and look through that and see how we uh, calculated the math for each of those, uh, each of those uh, projects. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn things over to Sid. Sid? Thank you, Norm. Before we go through a quick overview of the project application, we would like to update you on a couple of changes to the application itself. Screen 6A, standard performance measures, and 6B, additional performance measures, have been removed from the project application. All references to leverage under the match leverage section of the application have been removed. HUD is now only requiring match. The project application process is conducted in eSNAPS, the online registration, application, and grants management system for HUD COC programs. You can access eSNAPS via the HUD Exchange at www.hudexchange.info slash eSNAPS. Before creating the project application, project applicants need to access the project applicant profile to either one, create the profile if you are a new project applicant, or two, update the profile if you are a renewal project applicant. Make sure the information in the project applicant profile is accurate and current, such as the authorized and secondary contacts. Project application in eSNAPS allows, one, the grant applicant or recipient to update the project applicant profile and the SF-424. Two, the SF-424 must be completed in order to access the project application in eSNAPS. Three, grant applicants or recipients must provide documentation of applicant and subrecipient eligibility to apply for COC program funding, which includes nonprofit documentation, two certifications, a code of conduct, and SFLLL, disclosure of lobbying, if applicable. There are two important attachments we would like to uh, note. The HUD 2880, which is the Applicant Recipient Disclosure Update Report, and the HUD 50070 Drug-Free Workplace. The HUD 2880 must include the correct amount of HUD assistance requested and be dated between July 1, 2016 and September 1, 2016. The HUD 50070, if, if, this, if the project applicant is submitting more than one project application, a HUD 50070 must be completed for each project, or the project applicant can complete one HUD 50070 and list or attach all project locations. This form also must be dated between July 1st, 2016 and September 1st, 2016. And to reiterate, the HUD 2880 and the HUD 50070 must be updated yearly. We will now move on to renewal grants for the project application. Applicants apply for funding for eligible renewal projects with annual renewal amounts, or ARA, which reflect the amounts in the FY 2016 final HUD approved GIW and do not increase with the overall approved ARD, or annual renewal demand. The project application in eSNAPS allows applicants with eligible renewal projects to only request one year grant terms and one year of renewal funding. Any project-based rental assistance or project that has operating costs may request up to a 15 year grant term. However, the applicant may only request one year of funding. Funding for the remainder of the term is subject to availability and applicants must apply for additional funds at such time as and in such manner as HUD may acquire, as may, may require. Applicants requesting first-term renewals of shelter plus care grants may request a number of units under lease at the time of GW, GIW approval, regardless, regardless of whether the number of units exceed the number stated in the original grant agreement. In order to exceed the number of units stated in the original grant agreement, 
HUD required applicants to provide copies of the leases at GIW approval. If the applicant failed to provide the leases at GIW approval, HUD will limit the maximum number of units to the HUD approved GIW. This means that HUD will award renewals based on the number of units in the HUD approved GIW. Additionally, applicants requesting first time renewals of Shelter Plus Care projects originally awarded for five years must calculate one year renewal funding at current FMR plus 7% admin costs. Additional projects that are eligible for renewal in the project application on eSNAPS are one, any COC program, SHP, or Shelter Plus Care grant awarded in a preceding competition that expires in calendar year 2017, so January 1st to December 31st, 2017. Two, any renewal project currently in operation with an expiration date in calendar year 2016, which is January 1st, 2016 to de through December 31st, 2016. And three, any FY10 projects that have not renewed yet must come in for renewal in FY 2016. The reason for this is FY2010 projects funds will no longer be available after September 30th, 2016. And LOCKS requires that all drawdowns be made by September 22nd, 2016. We will now move on to new projects, which consist of reallocation and new bonus projects. Only the following new projects may be, re may be created through reallocation. One, PHPSH for 100% chronically homeless individuals and families. Two, PHRRH for individuals, families with children, homeless unaccompanied youth who come directly from the streets, emergency, sh emergency shelters, and persons fleeing domestic violence. Number three, dedicated HMIS that must be submitted by the HMIS lead. And four, dedicated SSO for coordinated entry only. Two important points to reiterate. Permanent supportive housing projects must serve program participants who are 100% chronically homeless. And two, rapid rehousing projects created through reallocation can only serve individuals, families with children, and homeless unaccompanied youth who come directly from the streets, emergency shelters, or are persons fleeing domestic violence. For new bonus projects, the applications that may be submitted are uh, PSH for the chronically homeless and RRH for individuals and or families with children. The proposed program participants must be homeless, coming from the streets, emergency shelters, or places not meant for human habitation. Again, to reiterate, permanent supportive housing projects must serve 100% chronically homeless program participants, and RRH projects may request funding to serve homeless individuals, families with children, homeless unaccompanied youth, and persons fleeing domestic violence. The same rules that apply for PHRH for reallocation also apply to PHRH for new bonus projects. For our final two points on COC planning and UFA, United Funding Agencies, COC planning grants are new for each competition and calculated based on 3% or 1.25 million, whichever is less of the FPRN. The COC planning costs were automatically calculated in the eSNAPS registration based on the FPRN. For collaborative applicants that HUD designates as UFAs, this designation is only for one year. If HUD designated a collaborative applicant, a UFA, in the FY 2015 COC program funding process, the collabor and the collaborative applicant desired to be a UFA for FY 2016, the collaborative applicant must have applied and been approved by HUD for UFA designation during the FY 2016 registration process. Collaborative applicants designated as UFAs must apply for UFA costs in each competition. For those collaborative applicants approved for UFA designation, ESAMS will automatically calculate the UFA costs available, which will be 1.5% or $500,000, whichever is less of the COC's FPRN. And with that, I will now turn it to Linda to speak about the COC application. Thank you. We'll now walk through the four parts of the COC application. These four parts are the same as in the FY 2015 application. They are Part 1, COC Structure and Governance, which addresses engagement, coordination, discharge planning, centralized and coordinated assessment, project review, ranking, and selection, and addressing project capacity. Part 2, Data Collection and Data Quality, addresses HMIS and PIT implement, 
implementation, funding, bed coverage, data quality, and methods. Part three, COC performance and strategic planning objectives, which are based on the COC's plan for and progress towards reducing homelessness and decreasing the number of reoccurrences of homelessness. This includes ending chronic homelessness, ending homelessness among families with children, and um, ending youth homelessness and ending veteran homelessness. Part four, cross-cutting policies addressing accessing mainstream benefits and additional policies. Now for what's new for the 2016 COC application. Changes you will see are the NOFA continues to focus on the administration's goals articulated in opening doors, federal strategic plan to prevent and end homelessness. The two specific questions for opening doors have been incorporated throughout the application to focus these priorities across all areas. New questions. There are two new questions that address unaccompanied homeless youth related to the pit count. There are also two new questions related to system performance measures data in the HDX. COCs will be attaching a copy of their system performance report that was generated in HDX to this year's application. These system performance measures can be found in the System Performance Measures Introductory Guide found on the HUD Exchange. What, what's remained the same this year? The good news is there are a few changes from the FY 2015 COC application. The questions in the application continue to to support HUD's policy priorities as were outlined earlier in this broadcast, as well as performance and strategic planning, structure and governance, data collection and quality, and cross-cutting policies. HUD continues to look for ways to shift reliance from narrative-based questions to questions that include data-driven charts, drop-down menus, and checkboxes in ways to streamline the application into more quantifiable objective criteria for evaluation. The application also continues to move towards performance-based outcomes. HUD would like to, to stress the importance of using the detailed instructions when completing your application. The detailed instructions should be used side-by-side as a companion guide to the COC application to ensure you have fully answered every question. For 2016, you will see a slightly different format for the detailed instructions from previous years. After each question in the detailed instructions, you will find additional important information to fully complete each question in the application. In many cases, the detailed instructions provide you with background, examples, and additional information. New this year is an instruction section within the detailed instructions. Many questions have multiple parts and require the applicant to answer each of these to fully complete the question. The instruction section enumerates the different parts of questions that should be answered. Applicants are strongly encouraged to read all of the detailed instructions for each question and answer all of the elements that have been provided. Now let's take a look at an example of information that is provided in the detailed instructions that will assist you in completing a question. Question 3B 2.8 states, using HMIS, compare all unaccompanied homeless youth including under age 18 and youth ages 18 to 24 served in any HMIS contributing program who are in an unsheltered situation prior to entry in FY14, October 1st, 2013 to September 30th, 2014, and FY15, October 1st, 2014 to September 30th, 2015. In this question, applicants are asked to provide information related to unaccompanied youth, both those under age 18 and youth ages 18 to 24. For this question, you are asked to use HMIS data to compare all unaccompanied youth in a number of data fields. Data, the detailed instructions provides guidance for the information you will need from HMIS. To assist applicants with completing this question, we have provided a chart with the HMIS number, 
field name and relevant data. Throughout the detailed instructions, you will be provided with background examples and clarification like the chart you have just seen. Other examples of how the detailed instructions can assist you are how to use the COC Consolidated Plans Crosswalk in determining responses to multiple questions, providing definitions, for example, general and limited preference when answering questions related to PHA, emphasis regarding HUD expectations for providing responses, and much, much more. Again, we encourage you to use the detailed instructions as a companion as you complete your application. Now I'd like to talk about the priority listing. The FY 2016 COC priority listing is part of the COC consolidated application. All projects approved by the COC must be listed on the COC priority listing in rank order with the exception of project applications for COC planning and UFA costs, which are not ranked. The priority listing establishes the projects located within Tier 1 and Tier 2 as described in Section 2B16 of the FY16 NOFA. Projects must be reviewed and either accepted and ranked or rejected by the COC. The purpose of this two-tiered approach is for the COCs to clearly indicate to HUD which projects are prioritized for funding. Reallocation forms are permanently attached to the COC priority listing in eSNAPs. Collaborative applicants have the ability to create new projects through reallocation by reducing and or eliminating eligible renewal projects. COCs may use reallocation to create new permanent supportive housing that will serve the following. Chronically homeless individuals and families, including unaccompanied youth coming directly from the streets or emergency shelters, or fleeing domestic violence, or other persons who meet the criteria of paragraph 4 of the definition of homelessness. HMIS and supportive services only for a centralized or coordinated assessment system. Please note, COCs have the ability to rank order all new and renewal projects on the priority listing. Again, UFA costs and COC planning projects are not ranked. Now I'd like to turn back to Norm. Thank you very much, Linda, and thank you, Sid. So we want to direct you to some resources that are available to help you with the COC application. So on the screen, you can see a couple of the list, uh, resources that are available on the HUD Exchange. I want to particularly point you to the Ask a Question feature. So uh, people ask you know, us hundreds of questions, thousands of questions through the Ask a Question feature. This is really one of the best places. Uh, if you have a question that's not addressed in uh, our instructional guides or our detailed instructions uh, or in some other place, uh, you know, we really want you to submit it to the Ask a Question. Uh, so again, there are uh, numerous resources that are available for you would also say that if you're not signed up for the listserv, it is really important that you sign up for the listserv. We provide a lot of messages. Uh, for example, we did a set of competition-focused messages that really flesh out the policy priorities and really provide some important context and information, uh, both about this particular NOFA and about our work in general going forward. It's really important that you read those messages. It is probably one of the best ways to get a sense of uh, the bigger picture and how you should be approaching, uh, again, not just the competition, but uh, your overall work uh, in uh, ending homelessness. So lastly, I want to leave you with a few sort of final thoughts, recommendations, things to take into consideration as you are uh, looking at the COC application process. So the first thing that's really important to think about is that you really should be considering reallocation every year. Uh, I know that there are many uh, communities that have done reallocation for a long time, uh, and maybe all the projects are permanent housing, uh, and maybe they're all performing very well. But the process of improving and making progress towards the goals of ending homelessness really require that you're doing this every single year. Every year we're learning new things about how to do uh, projects better, about how to do homeless assistance better, 
and it is really sort of a continuous improvement process. So you really should be looking at every single project every year, rating their performance, and having a robust process that allows you to reallocate any time there's an opportunity to improve the overall set of projects you have and to make even more progress on ending homelessness. We also know that there are a lot of communities that really haven't done very much reallocation or possibly no reallocation at all, uh, and that have really struggled with this. And, uh, you know, you may be a little behind the curve on this, but it's all, always important to get started and to really uh, uh, try to move that process forward as much as you can. Uh, so reallocation, considering reallocation every year, uh, is just going to be important, certainly for this year, but it will be important every year going forward. So it's really important that COCs think about this as a year-round process and always be considering reallocation. Measuring and improving system performance, again, is another critical feature of the continuum of care application and just our overall work in ending homelessness. We, for the first time, have system performance measures that are going to be reported as part of the COC application. Uh, system performance measures are really a very different way of uh, evaluating performance. It evaluates performance on a community-wide basis, not just a project-by-project -project basis. And we have a lot of materials up on the HUD Exchange related to system performance. Uh, but this is really sort of one of the fundamental ways you should be looking at how you are uh, improving, how you do homeless assistance, how you are thinking about applying for money, and how you are just making progress on your goal of preventing and ending homelessness. So we strongly encourage you to really spend some time with the system performance measures, look at your data closely, really try to uh, not just look at the data you're submitting to us, but to dig into the measures. And again, we have some great content on the HUD exchange about system performance that you should uh, really, really look at. Uh, this year, what we're asking about system performance uh, is really to, uh, to, to run the numbers, to uh, produce them out of your HMIS and to report them to us. Uh, we know that the quality of the data is going to be a long-term project. Uh, we're not going to have these measures perfect in year one. We don't expect them to be perfect in year one. But it is really, really important that you report uh, what you have to us. So the process of ranking projects based on need and performance, again, is a very important part of this overall COC process. And I want to stress a couple things related to this. Now, we uh, have to create an application process and a, and a competition process uh, that as much as possible can work across every uh, COC, every type of COC. But we also know that there are significant differences in COCs. They have different types of geography, different types of programs, different populations, different challenges. So we know that we can't uh, completely micromanage how this process should work. So we try to build into the COC process uh, a lot of room for communities to really think through uh, how they're applying, think through how they're organizing their assistance, think through what projects they're prioritizing, how they assess need and performance, uh, and what they prioritize and protect in the process. So there's really a balance between sort of we're trying to make sure that our incentives move people uh, as quickly as possible toward the goal of uh, ending homelessness, but at the same time recognizing that a lot of this work is uh, stuff that is going to have to happen at the local level and uh, take into consideration, you know, the specific challenges of a uh, of a particular COC. And I just want to provide a, you know, sort of one example that plays out uh, and, and something that we really want you to factor into your decisions about, uh, about uh, ranking and need and performance and what goes in Tier 1 and Tier 2. So this is, again, going back to the uh, example of uh, projects that are serving people fleeing domestic violence. Uh, we know that there are, for example, some COCs that cover a large geographic area. Uh, maybe a regional or a balance of state or statewide COC, where there are some areas where there are just very few projects and maybe even uh, an area where, you know, one uh, domestic violence transitional housing project is the only project in that area, uh, and it is the only resource for people who need to flee an abusive situation and need to a safe place to go. 
Now, our expectation is that, uh, that, that, that if that's a significant need in your community and that plays out that way, that you would incorporate that into your process for prioritizing uh, how you rank projects. So we don't just want you to look at the type of project and just uh, sort of blindly put you know, all the permanent housing projects at the top. Uh, and you know other types of projects at the bottom. Although we certainly want you to take into consideration the effectiveness of projects, uh, how quickly they're helping people move into permanent housing, how effective they are. Uh, so we want you to take all those things into consideration. But you really have to have a, a, a very nuanced view and uh, take into account a lot of different factors as you are thinking about how to rank projects. Now, those uh, in that example, those DV projects, we also want those to be uh, excellent projects that are uh, doing the best work we can possibly do for people fleeing domestic violence. So if you find projects like that or that are lower performing, we certainly want you to uh, consider reallocating to uh, uh, other types of projects that will uh, serve the same population. But again, we, you really have to sort of consider uh, the, this need and performance in the context in which these projects uh, are serving people. Uh, and we hope we've provided you with enough tools in the competition process to really uh, take those factors into consideration. Uh, so the next thing I want to talk about is uh, lowering barriers to projects. Uh, we just think this is very important. We think we made a lot of progress in the last uh, competition in uh, ensuring that projects are lowering barriers and serving, for example, people with addictions or people uh, with no income or poor employment history uh, or things like that. Uh, and so we really want uh, projects to continue uh, focusing on that. Uh, we have provided and will be providing uh, things uh, related to equal access to projects and to uh, serving transgender individuals. And we, we really want to make sure that our projects are serving the people who are actually experiencing homelessness in the community, that there are uh, as few barriers as possible, if any barriers at all, uh, and that our projects are as welcoming to people as they can possibly be. And then uh, lastly, it's uh, just really important that, uh, that uh, in, in the majority of cases, projects are using housing first practices. Uh, there are really very few exceptions where a project uh, shouldn't be using housing first uh, practices. So, uh, we'd encourage you, obviously, not just to look at that in your application and to check the boxes and to answer the questions in the application, but we really want COCs to be paying attention to this, uh, to reviewing the degree to which projects are actually lowering, lowering barriers, to review the degree to which they're actually using housing first practices. And one of the reasons we uh, increased the amount of funding for COC planning, both last year and this year, is we really want COCs to have a more central role in uh, ensuring that projects are doing the best uh, they can and are the, uh, use the best practices they can for improving overall system performance uh, and take you as quickly as possible toward uh, the goal of ending homelessness. So I want to thank everyone uh, very much for uh, listening to this broadcast. And I uh, want to thank Linda and Sid for uh, joining me on this broadcast. And I really want to say a, a special word to everyone out there who's working on ending homelessness in your communities. We know this is really hard work. Uh, we know that there are many, many very difficult decisions you have to make. Certainly, we have uh, difficult choices and trade-offs we have to make. Uh, and I just, just want to express the degree that we really, really appreciate uh, the work you put into it, the, the challenging uh, nature of what you have to do. Uh, it is never easy to reallocate a project or to deprioritize a project. Uh, you know, these are people we work with uh, closely uh, or, you know, over the course of a year. So we appreciate uh, people making the tough decisions, and we appreciate your work going forward on this. Thank you very much. <laughs>